Hi, I'm Sarah Murphy from BNI. I'm architects. We are the architects of record um, on the reach. And I just want to quickly extend a thank you to ACI and to Yvonne uh, for the invitation to speak with you today. Uh, the presentation I'm giving will give a brief overview of the architectural design and hopefully not overlapping too much with um, what Jeff beautifully presented um, of the reach, which is, as you know, an expansion to the Kennedy Center um, in southwestern Washington, D.C. This privately funded building was designed by Stephen Hall Architects and completed in the fall of 2019. A quick outline of where we will be headed today. I'll give a relatively speedy orientation of the why, where, who, and when um, before spending a bit more effort and digging into some um, specific moments of how from an architectural coordination perspective. The Kennedy Center is a living monument to President John F. Kennedy and uh, the original building, as Jeff mentioned, designed by Edward Durrell Stone in the 60s as a modernist theater block. It houses three main re theater rooms, Concert Hall, Opera House, and Eisenhower Theater uh, for pre theatrical performances, as well as smaller theaters, a cafe, and staff offices. Um, the expansion was a call to allow the performing arts to move into the 21st century, reaching a new audience and making the performing arts more accessible for future generations, as well as providing um, more state-of-the-art rehearsal space. So on the top left here, you can see an old original concept model um, showing the enduring scheme of the project, which is three pavilions floating above a green roof underneath which is additional program space blending into the landscape. And the main tenants of the design um, have carried through and in, in, throughout all the designer iterations. Um, the first one being fusion with landscape and the river, trying to really reintegrate the Kennedy Center into the landscape, pulling it away from this sort of highway um, chaos that it's currently located in, playing with the idea of, of music and performance and the building form itself, in that the building is the instrument and the light is what activates it. Um, a commitment to material innovation and its relationship to that form, which Jeff really clearly um, also showed in some of the concrete, specific concrete methodologies and ecological integration. Um, so just a aerial screenshot showing um, its relationship to the National Mall. So the National Mall being here, the Kennedy Center as a monument does want to be related to the National Mall, um, but has been sort of blocked off by some major vehicular thoroughfares um, since the 60s when it was built. And the site that we are working in um, was previously partially bus parking, turnaround, and parking garage, which the Kennedy Center um, identified as not being as useful as um, the expansion that was built. I really love this page from a magazine called Clog that was um, published in August of 2012. Um, and it was, it's featuring basically design studies of the National Mall. And this shows monuments on the mall over time, and it sort of increasing in scope and layout of plan um, and complexity of plan. Um, and the Kennedy Center extension is obviously as an act, active building rather than just a monument, a little different. Um, but the move from the highly symmetrical existing building to the exper experiential and fluid hall extent, expansion is not unprecedented. Um, the location of the Kennedy Center was a product of the highway building and car access at the time it was built. It has adjacency, but a lack of access to the mountain monuments in the city. The expansion navigates this by framing views to the monuments, as well as providing increased physical connection to the pedestrian and transit routes of the city. Um, note that this plan and several of my plans throughout the project are, or throughout the presentation are rotated with left being north um, with the ex existing Kennedy Center over here to the left. I won't be touching much on the bridge running over Rock Creek Parkway, but the success of this project 
and its landscape as an activation and remeshing of major pedestrian and bicycle routes was dependent on the construction of this bridge. This section shows the relationship of the program to the elevation of the existing building kind of grayed out here in the background. Um, and the floor to floor height of this building was constrained by needing to plug into the existing parking garage, which had quite tight floor to floor height. Um, so there are these moments of compression throughout the building that expand into our double height spaces. Okay, I'm going to play a fly through. Um, a note on this video is produced by a third party renderer um, off of um, Stephen Hall's office's Rhino model, which was kept up to date throughout for design, proof of design. Um, and the documentation and coordination primarily happened in Revit and Autodesk projects, products. So some stats about the project. The addition is approximately 64,000 square feet with some enabling work inside the existing building of about 3,000 square feet. Um, the park, bus parking garage that Jeff showed as the slab on grade area is around 40,000 40, square feet and then the Stand this river pavilion, which you see through the glass here in the background, is right around 8,500. Um, the program is three large rehearsal rooms, a leasable event space that we just currently toured, uh, projection capabilities for out, outdoor simulcast performances and film showing, the ability to quote unquote see behind the scenes into rehearsal spaces, as we're seeing here, um, flexible spaces for more casual performances and audience integration and classrooms for increased educational programming. In terms of materials, the reach is fundamentally a building of concrete, glass, cherry wood and bead blasted steel. Um, the concrete frame structure with either, whether it's whitewashed as an in interior or with integrally colored titanium white um, forms the envelope of the three pavilions. The interior has a polished concrete floor, acoustical plaster ceilings throughout, and cherry wood used for doors and acoustical paneling. So here we are entering the Justice Forum, which is the lecture hall space in the project, which is one of four spaces to use this acoustic crinkled concrete. And here we are entering the education spaces, which part of the mission was to be able to have more all ages activities occurring within this, within this space. And as we go out into the landscape, this deck was modeled off of the length of Kennedy's PT 109 and the Ginkgo Grove to the south contains 35 Ginkgo trees representing him as the 35th president that all drop their leaves simultaneously in November around the time of his assassination. In the River Pavilion is imagined to be sort of more of a cabaret jazz club space with a strong connection to landscape for indoor outdoor performances. And then the simulcast slash video screening um, projection surface, which is actually projecting from the existing Kennedy Center from a cutout in the existing Kennedy Center. Um, is imagined as a way of bring, truly having the ability to have public performances on the project. So really quickly, just what we're referring to as, as we're flying around here, the main entry building, the welcome pavilion, um, the upper lawn, which is where folks will gather to watch projections off the north wall of the skylight pavilion, the bridge connecting to a major pedestrian and cycling thoroughfare, that connects all the way north south through the city to the mall to the Lincoln Memorial just to the southeast and the river pavilion. So I'm not going to go through this whole timeline, um, but I do think that it's important to note sort of what what occurred. So um, in January 2013 SHA Stephen Hall Architects is announced to design the Kennedy Center and a whole bunch happens in between and in September 2019 is the public opening. Um, 
for your reference, uh, me, your presenter, joined the project right around 100% design development. And I moved to Washington, D.C. from Kansas City in May of 2015 to be the on-site architectural representative during construction. Some notes about the project team. Um, the Kennedy Center, the client with the vision, um, was represented by Paradise Group, who helped wrangle a lot of um, the day-to-day -day coordination happening on site with between the parties. So in, an, in a contractual world, this would be the com communication flow. Um, in reality, um, among the architects and clients um, with me on site, this was more what, what we saw and what was needed. And then it's also important to note that Fuchina, later bought by Lane, um, was on the project early as a design assist in concrete and they had Commun direct communication and close coordination um, with a lot of the other um, teams on the project. And there's not room here. Um, I do want to note that David Harvey of HNBA um, was the acoustic engineer on this project. Um, okay, so that's that's it for the overview. And here we are diving into some, some details that I think are representative of some of the um, some of the little microcosms of the design on the project. So the first one is what Jeff touched on earlier, which is the crinkled concrete, which takes place in the studio rooms as well as the large lecture hall um, that are outlined here. And again, north is to the left. So studios J, F, and K and the, the Justice Forum all have these um, crinkled concrete walls which are poured integrally with the structure and additive in thickness to the structural wall. So this is a photo of the rendering versus the reality um, with some coordination items to note are um, that everywhere we had a, one of these large monumental door openings, we, we grouped all of our electrical devices right there in a flat board formed area um, just to keep it tidy. And then this is actually the return air um, for, the, for this space. And there was under, under seat diffusers also cast into the concrete slab here. A little bit about the process of how crinkled concrete came to be. Stephen Hall's office in collaboration with David Harvey, the acoustical consultant, um, determined that in order to get a good scatter on, on the sound waves to prevent flutter echo, they needed about two and a half to three inches of random variation in the wall surface. So this isn't absorbing or deadening sound, it is simply scattering the sound. Um, and this is the sort of master form created in Stephen Hall's model shop by um, some of the architects there and getting shipped off to Fitzgerald Formwork in San Francisco by an art mover. This is a four by 10 sheet of metal acting as sort of the, po the positive for the negative. So here we can see the formwork for the crinkle concrete mock-up that we did. And I think it's rele relevant to note that this foam block is serving as a way of being able to back the form um, back out when unforming from the wall. And it created this coordination moment in which we had to decide how we wanted that corner to look and how we wanted, which corner we wanted it to occur on in the space, which led to a series of plan details, understanding the thickness required for backing the form out as, as well as which being able to specify which wall we wanted that flat area to be on. This is a moment occurring during my um, during a site walk in which I noticed that there seemed to be a missing block out because this area here um, was actually to receive a um, piece of interior glass at, at the stair which we'll look at later and this is the means of communication and then it here's here's the fix so this is from the formwork submittal 
showing the thickness of that form liner, its plywood backing, and its relationship to the corner detailing. And then here's the inside corner of that as pour um, before being unformed. And then some moments of coordination of these crinkled concrete walls. Um, so we had these somewhat elaborate, large acoustic wood doors, which were simply surface mounted in terms of the frames to the face of the concrete at the jam head. Um, and then we also had these areas where we held the concrete back to simply the structural wall thickness, um, allowing the crinkle to sit proud so that we could recess um, mirrors for the performance studios. I really love this photo because it shows a lot of things happening. Um, one of the things that's happening is that I am being asked to confirm that the rotation of the panels is correct, <laughs> which I did before they stood up each of these gangs of formwork um, based on sketches that were produced in um, coordination in the submittal process. Um, and then these folks are actually bondoing fastener holes so that they won't telegraph through to the finished face of the concrete. And part of that is because only a certain number, and Yvonne can probably speak to this, um, only a certain number of form liner panels were ordered and they needed to be reused um, in order to form all the walls. And then in the background here, you can see um, what I was talking about earlier, this sort of flat place at our board form concrete walls where um, we've got all of our devices aligned. Um, a funny thing about the device alignment on this project is that we wanted the edge of the device to all be aligned left. Um, so back boxes of various lengths are located um, per understanding what the cut sheet is and its relationship to the edge of the device. And um, I believe actually this photo was taken the morning of a pour um, and Charlie DePhillip of J.E. Richards had uh, laid these out that morning based on a sketch sent the night prior. So some pretty fast coordination happening on site. And then this photo I think is a great example of sort of what these walls are doing spatially. So um, you can see here, two of the studios and then the main Studio K space. Um, and these walls are acting as solid planes running east-west that allows the light to pour in from the west in the final condition. Staying sort of in this zone, um, stair one is one of my favorite moments on the project. So if we dial in, it's nestled in between two of the rehearsal rooms in between them and the hydronics room. And it's basically came about as a solution to a dead end corridor problem on, on the upper level. And it became this really graceful little moment of um, cast in place there on the project. So you can see here on the left, our Revit model. And this is an example of sort of the level of detail we had in our Revit model. So not presentation quality, but um, or rendering quality, but really um, trying to get the coordination items figured out here. So, and then here it is just raw concrete and in the final condition with the sky, this triangular skylight installed and our interior glazing aligned flush with face and board form in the corridor and everything whitewashed with acoustic plaster above. Um, this moment is exactly what I wanted to see as I imagined this stair coming together, which is that it's this glimpse into the rehearsal room, this little landing space inside the project. Um, you can see here the detailing of the guard rail shoe um, aligned with the top of concrete wall. And then here, I'm actually walking on the skylight looking down at the illuminated stair below. In plan, just to give you a sense of sort of what all this stair is navigating, um, this stair underneath the low landing here, this is the glazing where folks were looking into the rehearsal room. This actually serves as a supply air plenum supplementing the, the diffusers in, in this secondary rehearsal room. Um, 
there's also a return air perforated wall into Studio K, a duct running above that to feed the corridor from, from the landing above, and some cable pass-throughs allowing for a connection to to the bus to the, sorry to the parking garage if there was ever to be some sort of news feed of a performance. Here's that all all those systems together as an axonometric. Here's our ducts, our return air, um, our large return air plenum, our return air duct exposed inside the space here. This is the concrete stripped away and just just the systems. And here's just the concrete by itself. And so we have this folded ceiling plane navigating this duct layout. And here's this wall. So um, I know that I said that the crinkle concrete was poured integrally with the structural wall all at the same time. That is the case, except in one location um, where um, the flat area was extended a little bit too far by accident and construction. And they actually came back in and, and poured, poured the texture on top. Here is the perforated walls formwork and the method for getting that th those holes in there. And then there was mesh installed after it was formed um, or after it was all stripped and cured on the backside to prevent things from falling through. And then this is the curb of the skylight above. Here it all is just as concrete. And so adjacent, here's that corner we were looking at, but let's move into Studio K. And um, Jeff did a great job of walking through the sawtooth slab. And I'd like to walk through it from an architectural coordination standpoint. Um, so a very similar photo to what Jeff showed and the final result, which is that the sawtooth shape, yes, it's allowing for a long span structurally, but the other thing it's allowing us to do is to tuck all of our theatrical lighting bars and equipment, our fire protection pipe, and recess our um, our light, our house lights, um, up into the ceiling and allow for this really clean ceiling plane. This is the formwork for the mock-up of the Sawtooth Lab. And what I like about this photo is that it shows how we were testing these various ways of holding the slab off of the existing crinkle wall. So here's some sketches showing some possibilities for how we might approach that, that connection. And here's the result, which is, this is actually a small piece of steel inserted in lieu of removable formwork to hold that edge off, off of the face of the crinkle wall there. And then this, this is, this end, the flat end, um, being held off by using a spacer. Okay, the T-beam, which Jeff also pointed out, had some unique architectural coordination constraints, um, one of which was that the length compared to, so in, a, in addition to what Jeff mentioned in terms of having tight tolerances for deflection, um, because we're actually using it as glazing sill for the upper level and glazing head for the lower level um, was that it also had really tight accessibility parameters. Um, the Kennedy Center is a leader in accessibility in the performing arts, and we really were cutting it close in terms of navigating from the upper level here to, to the roof level to the north. Um, so, in addition to having tight constraints for for glazing and deflection reasons, it also had tight constraints um, for the purposes of getting this ramp within parameters. Here you can see the detailing as it's sort of tying in um, to the crinkle wall. There's a little offset um, created by a cork in sill that allows the, the beam to slide past the wall. And here's that from above. Um, this is the T-beam running here. It's a little tricky to see. Um, but you also can see that there are these, um, these core drills for um, hydronic and sprinkler piping running below it as well because we were hiding them on the backside of the beam here. So this is parallel to the structural coordination sheet that Jeff showed. But what this set 
of um, drawings is doing is showing the elevation that we want to stop the nominal thickness of the wall and the elevation that we want to stop the crinkle elevation of the wall um, at every side of every wall that the T-beam intersects because the T-beam is not running perpendicular, it's running at a slight angle to those walls and it's changing elevation as it does so. So this was um, rather than uh, setting setting lane loose in our model, asking them to fend for themselves um, and not being sure that we were actually, we would actually get the geometry we wanted. We went ahead and made this sheet for coordination. And this is also Jeff touched on, this is the bearing pad. So what we're looking at here, we're looking down at the MDF smooth formwork of the T-beam, the post-tensioning, and the, um, this is the top of the crinkle concrete wall, which they scribed the cork filler to meet, and then scribed the MDF form to that and placed these bearing pads in. And you can also see the conduit that's getting run to, to our various devices inside the beam here, coming out of the wall there. Um, so all of the systems that this needed to coordinate with um, where the sprinkler pipe, hydronic piping, lighting drivers, because we have this um, really lovely um, acid etched glass with white inner layer that throughout the project, the lighting strategy is to graze that with light so that it glows from the outside um, and serves as a really diffuse light from the natural light in the daytime. Um, here you can see the underside of the vent plate that's picking up the head of the curtain wall and is fastened to the top side of the T-beam. Um, the roller shades that we have, we're using the T-beam as a sort of a roller shade pocket. And then this here is our acoustical mullion cap, um, which is connecting the edge of the concrete, the crinkled concrete wall to our mullion. So next is our landscape swoops, which Jeff also touched on, but I'll, I'll go into a little bit of detail about um, how those are coordinated. So they exist in three locations on the project. Um, two at the Skylight Pavilion event space and one at the Welcome Pavilion, which is the largest. So the two I'm gonna talk about are at the northwest corner of the event space. Um, one is a simple fold above the event space and then the other is a um, more parabolic form um, to, just to the west there that comes down and actually engages the T-beam. One of the considerations, so something to note about these slabs is that they are not exposed architecturally. They receive an acoustic plaster finish on the underside and this sedum net on the, the top side. So they're acting as roofs and are waterproofed as such. Um, this is a mock-up of where we were testing um, which acoustic plaster system we wanted to go with to see how it would look um, choosing one of the more extreme moments of the vaulted slab. This is a mock-up of the um, sedum, which was in place for a year to make sure that the sedum would grow at this variation of slope um, and not, not die off at the top or the bottom. And this existed in Culpeper, Virginia, out at the Semper Green Hydrotech yard. So this is the formwork submittal um, for this vaulted slab, which was poured in shotcrete um, and showing its relationship to this edge of the Glissando, or sorry, the um, Skylight Pavilion, which I will show in more detail in a few photos. Um, so what we wanted was for the sedum to come up and form a vertical line in which there's really no um, sort of no moment of stutter step between um, the line of the sedum and the, the line of the pavilion. Um, so this is the line, the datum line where we're going to meet. So here it is in Shotcrete. Um, this is actually not exactly in the same location, but it's a good example of showing our waterproofing method, um, the stick pins to hold our insulation, our roof insulation, and then 
these string lines were actually used to determine the geometry of the sedum net, um, which can be defined by, by straight lines throughout, throughout the project. And here we are at the upper level. So that's that canopy of the skylight pavilion here. Um, this is the corner we were concerned about. And this is showing its relationship to the other swoop beyond, um, showing this anchoring, bent plate anchoring system for, for the sedum net and our gutter up above. <laughs> this, um, this is a funny little moment on the project in which the sedum swoop and the door geometry didn't quite play nice. We have these monumental doors that wanted to be a certain, at a certain height. Um, and so what we actually did was we created a little, this is a section cut right through this moment, created a little infill, um, but had to hold it back enough because if you see in plan, this is a pivot door and we needed room for the pivot back screen. So we were able to seal this up in white in, in concrete and then that joint actually got covered by the thickness of the sedum. So here's the um, sedum net installation in progress. And you can see here that we're navigating this corner by creating this sort of vertical gutter that a lot of the um, irrigation um, tubing is running through. And here it is completed um, right around time of opening. So I want to make sure we're doing okay on time. Um, so the Glissando Pavilion, as it was originally called, was called that because a glissando is a moment in music in which um, you're either running your your hand across a harp, harp string. Basically, you're blurring a lot of line, a lot of notes in sequence altogether. And so this shape was supposed to imitate the curve of a bow uh, running across a violin um, when um, when performing a glissando, but it is now called the Skylight Pavilion. So sorry if I mix those up. Um, it is a event space intended to be um, a leasable event space and a moment of revenue generation for the Kennedy Center. Um, and it features a curved concrete wall that Jeff went through on the formwork. And then the glazing is actually also curved, but at a different angle. Um, because of glass production requirements. It's a true um, tonical form, the glass. So here's the, a, a snapshot actually of the um, Stephen Hall's working model, which exists, I believe, and is still on display at the Kennedy Center if you ever go. Um, it was updated throughout the course of the project. And then on the right, again, this space in raw concrete right around the time of topping out. Um, here's, here it is um, as the floor is being finished and then full of people at the opening, which is, I know, a little bit of an alarming sight in the year 2021. But um, So here's, here's what I was mentioning about some of the... Um, one of the funny things about having a concrete wall that is your exterior envelope that also goes nearly flat at some point is that it wants to perform as a roof. Um, so this wall actually was um, needed to be, after it was poured, injected with epoxy um, to make sure that any of those hairline cracks that occurred um, were not telegraphing water through the wall and into our event space. And then um, again, that sloped wall creates unique, sloped and curved wall creates unique uh, considerations when coordinating things like roller shades and, um, and landscape outside. I'm going to kind of gloss through um, our mock up because I think Jeff did a really great job of going through what that was trying to serve um, from a structural standpoint. Um, I really love the way that these forms are created um, with these nestled pieces all together, taking translating the three D geometry that we we gave um, Harry into um, in, into this series of planar data, and then something that we got as a submittal after each one of these forms was made and the concrete wall was poured was a deviation map um, showing how different it was from the design geometry. And that was our way of navigating 
um, whether or not details were going to need to to be considered, um, and and if if the wall would be rejected. Um, here is the exterior face of the form work, getting the form liner boards installed. Um, and we actually discovered on this project that our spec was not written particularly clearly in specifying variation in length. And so that was something that um, we worked through and worked to create more clear uh, delineations on so that it wouldn't need to be redone um, and would create a truly random pattern. And again, um, just the quantity, the scope of formwork required to re resist those loads that Jeff was talking about. Um, I really love this little moment also on the project, which is what to do about the tie holes. Um, so there, of course, were aesthetic concerns, but there also were waterproofing concerns on this project. So they ended up actually grouting back in the portion of the tie that is shown here, grouting back here, and then creating these cast plugs um, and carefully placing them into the wall to as closely match the texture as possible. And lastly, um, when it came down to it, a lot of what you see is the result of um, labor. And here is somebody scraping the fins off of um, that are produced in a space between the wood boards while the wall is still relatively green, just to really create that level of detail and refinement that we were looking on this project. So um, thank you for your time, and that is my presentation. Thanks very much, Sarah. Uh, lots of interesting points there.